Hello, Hello, everyone. Hi there. Welcome to our second episode of our Roadmap to Oil and Gas Protections webinar series. We're going to get started in just a minute with our exciting lineup of speakers as we allow more participants to join. If you are at your computer, we highly recommend clicking the link to join uh, the video option. We will be using slides and pictures throughout the program, and we don't want you to miss out. So after the program, we will email you the recording. And um, for those who've signed up in the beginning, and we will have access to content for future reference. All right, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our webinar roadmap to oil and gas protections. I'm Vanessa Lynch, the Pennsylvania field organizer for Moms Clean Air Force. I've been working with Lisa Graves Marcucci from the Environmental Integrity Project and Robin Martin with Food and Water Watch to create this series of webinars focused on how and why we should be advocating for protective oil and gas industry safeguards for our communities. We will be keeping everyone on mute throughout the webinar, but we will be using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen for audience participation. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will respond directly via email to any unanswered questions. We'll be providing you with a lot of information tonight. So if you are new to advocating for oil and gas protections, the amount of information could feel a little overwhelming. Please know, Lisa, Robin, myself, we will all be available to you after this webinar to help you learn more, and we encourage you to reach out to us. So unconventional drilling or fracking can occur in any community, regardless of the size, concentrated residential or rural nature of the area, or socioeconomic makeup. Many local municipalities believe they have limited ability to create protections for their community with regard to shale gas development and its highly industrialized infrastructure. But in fact, the opposite is true. Local municipalities have the right and the responsibility to establish necessary protections for their community through land use zoning and ordinances. And these protections are grounded in Pennsylvania rules, regulations, and laws, and can be extremely important in order to create safeguards for the air our families breathe, our local water sources, our overall environment, and our community's current and future development. We are so excited to welcome attorney John Smith this evening. Mr. Smith is a member, partner, and co-founder of the law firm Smith Butts LLC in Washington County, Pennsylvania. Attorney Smith has been at the forefront of local zoning regulations on oil and gas drilling. He has tried hundreds of cases representing individuals, businesses, and municipalities in various courts and jurisdictions throughout Pennsylvania. He counsels a number of Western Pennsylvania municipalities and is often appointed a special counsel to consult on matters relating to oil and gas law and litigation. Attorney Smith was the lead attorney with John Kamen and Jordan Yeager, who successfully argued twice before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court on behalf of Pennsylvania local municipalities in the landmark case Robinson Township versus the Commonwealth. As a result, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court found several provisions of Act 13 the Pennsylvania Oil and Gas Act of 2012, unconstitutional, returning zoning rights back to the people's respective local governments. 
And more recently, Mr. Smith received a favorable decision before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in EQT Production Company versus the Borough of Jefferson Hills in 2019. Attorney Smith has also spoken on various oil and gas and municipal issues, including on behalf of the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors in 2019, regarding the need for subdivision and land development approvals for oil and gas operators. Attorney Smith is prominently featured in the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Amity and Prosperity, for his work with local community members as they investigated and fought to understand the impacts of the oil and gas industry on their air and water. Much of what you will see and hear tonight frames the fundamental building blocks of local land use, zoning, and ordinances. Attorney Smith will be sharing lots of factual information that includes legal citations for reference, but the information will be supplemented with real world scenarios that will help provide context. Know that his slides and a video link to tonight's presentation will be mailed, made available at the conclusion of our webinar we are so, so, so excited to have attorney John Smith with us um, to present on what clearly we have outlined as an area of uh, extreme expertise for him. So without further ado, attorney John Smith. Thank you, Vanessa. Ho hopefully I live up to that billing. Uh, for those of you at home, I'll do my best to uh, bring this to you in an understandable format and I have a slide presentation that is, as they indicated, will remain available for you. So after this, you can take a look at that. And if you have any questions, they've built in significant time at the end for you to get the questions to us so that we can um, answer them as you see fit. Now, what I will try not to do for those of you who have given up your Thursday evening to spend their time with us is to bore you to tears. So understand what this is, is not a seminar about whether oil or gas is good for you or good for your municipality. This is not a policy debate, as you may see um, last night and other debates where I'm for fracking, I'm against fracking. What this is, is just a legal synopsis of what we need to do as local communities, what we can do, what we should do, and more importantly, how did we get here? How did we get to the point where we have this obligation to draft oil and gas ordinances? And as Vanessa pointed out, to understand this, you have to look at the constitution, Pennsylvania statutes, constitutional uh, provisions, and local ordinances. Now these all seem super boring. They were boring in law school, but in real life, as they pertain to your municipality, they are the front line for some heated exchanges. And our seminar today is to not only educate you, but to give you the information and the legal background necessary to understand these building blocks. You start from the beginning and we go from the beginning for how this works to how we see this in real life. Now, as was alluded to, you know, I have some experience in doing this and, and we'll walk through some of those things. I do represent municipalities that um, typically only allow for oil and gas activity in their industrial zoning district. Um, I am not here to advocate as to how you zone your municipality. I suspect most of you were elected or are in municipalities where that those districts were in place long before you came to town. And it is within the confines of those districts that we look at what you can do and why you can do certain things within those districts. So why don't we start moving forward? There are a number of slides. Some of them I will spend more time on. Some of them I will move quickly through that I leave for your um, knowledge and when this is over to refer back to. So um, Robin, if you wanna to go to our first slide. Again, as a background here, Prior to 2009, the Pennsylvania Oil and Gas Act um, hadn't been really addressed. And it basically, there was an understanding in Pennsylvania that it preempted local governments. So the reason why we are litigating these issues today is that it wasn't until 2009 that Pennsylvania local governments ever got involved with oil and gas, whether they be shallow or deep wells or any type of wells, because it was always thought 
that the state had preempted the field of oil and gas, leaving nothing for local governments to do. And that's the vestiges of that, as you see shallow wells in certain municipalities all over the place, because there were no local ordinances in place at the time. Uh, next slide. That changed, and this is just a history lesson, but again, a history lesson that's necessary to look back of where we came from with no regulations, how we got there. In the Huntley case in 2009, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, I believe unanimously, found that the Oil and Gas Act in Pennsylvania did not preempt local governments. And now this was crucial because in 2009, we were now dealing with Marcellus Wells. So, you know, in municipalities where I worked, we had uh, well sites, we had wells in place, and we were pretty much bystanders watching the um, oil and gas industry select where they were going to go, how they were going to do things, and we watched them go into our residential areas, into areas that we wanted to um, set aside for development, and sometimes landowners who own the property also own the gas, and because of that, they chose to place wells on their property. But understand under Pennsylvania law, if you don't own your gas, there is an implied right to use your surface. What does that mean? You don't own your gas rights and I do, or somebody in Texas does. They have the right to use your surface to put a well on it. And we're not talking about your old traditional shallow well, which may be 10 foot in diameter in terms of size. I'm involved with the well site in Washington County where the total footprint of the whole site from road to pad is 54 acres of land. So we're talking about a completely different area of wells. So as the court now cut the municipalities loose, we see the first case that fell from that is the Penico case. And the reason this is in here is that the Commonwealth Court has changed, which we'll speak about later. But if you look in what I provided, is that they talked again about prevention, but the big thing here is that the court found the restrictions on oil and gas drilling in certain zoning districts appear in Fayette County to be those pertaining to preserving the character of residential neighborhoods. Here, they were looking at keeping oil and gas drilling out of residential neighborhoods, and this court stood for the proposition that you could do that. So now, post Huntley, local governments face pressure by oil and gas to enact ordinances for allow, to allow oil and gas drilling. And the looking back at this, and I represented Cecil Township and Cecil Township at the time, I believe, at least we were credited, rightly or wrongly, drafting the first ordinance in Pennsylvania to deal with oil and gas. And mind you, we had activity, but we also had headquarters here in South Point of all the big local drillers. So we move forward as the, well, the next slide, please. Now, I jump forward a little bit on these timelines, and this is this is Act 13. This is Section 3303. And what happened was when local governments started to enact regulations and CECL and other ones started to restrict where they could go or try to improve upon the state laws, the industry had enough of that. So they went to their friends in the legislature and they passed Act 13. And Act 13 did a number of things, but what it did for local governments, those of you that may have been on the boards at the time, um, or those of you that may have paid attention at the time, it took us back to pre-2009 and it eliminated local governments. And basically, it eliminated on 3303, it left no doubt that we are now occupying the entire field of regulation to the exclusion of all local ordinances. Basically, environmental acts were acting as a preclusionary effect on local ordinances. Local governments, you cannot pass any laws that deal with the environment. And as we go to the next slide, local governments, you also can pass no laws relating to the location of oil and gas operations. In fact, we'll do it for you. And this is important for you to note because you will get industries or the state to try to distinguish the upcoming Robinson case, which we'll talk about by saying, well, the Robinson case merely struck down a state statute and we're dealing with local ordinances and they're completely different animals. Well, that is such a fiction, but some courts buy into that argument if they don't look. If you look at subsection A, 
what the state law said was that all local ordinances re regulating oil and gas operations shall allow for the reasonable development of oil and gas resources. And it shall in section B5, authorize oil and gas operations other than activities at the impoundment areas, compressor stations as a permitted use in all zoning districts. So what does this mean? This state law that had nothing to do with local ordinances was a directive to tell local governments, this is what your local ordinance should be. This is how it needs to read. And this was basically the overarching greatest local ordinance in the history of the Commonwealth. And so for, for industry argument now to say that this state law statute had no, no bearing on local ordinances, is just hoping you don't go back and read. So 3303 preempted your right to deal with environmental rules at the local level as to oil and gas. 3304 set forth that you better permit this in all zoning districts as a permitted use. And those of you know permitted uses means that there is no hearing, there is no opportunity for comment, and they come in, they pay their permit fee, and they hit the road and start drilling. Next slide. Now, we of course challenged that, and this takes me back, and I think I've spoken on this a hundred times since the time we did it, but this is a quote from the Supreme Court, and we, we did go to the Commonwealth Court first, but the court recognized the type of constitutional challenge presented today is as unprecedented in Pennsylvania as the legislation that engendered it. The court was impressed that we weren't arguing that you can't preempt local governments, you can. The state can tell local governments absolutely what to do. We are subservient to them. So what the argument was is that you can tell us what to do, you cannot tell us to do something that violates the constitution or the constitutional rights of our citizens. Important to note, right? Because a law that tries to allow drilling in all districts, mandates no environmental protections, the court finds that you can't do that at the state level because it violated the constitution. This is not about local rights per se, this was about citizens' constitutional rights. Next slide. Now, here are the two big ones that uh, really were the stars of the Act 13 challenge and are the impetus for a number of challenges that you will get at the local level and that you need to comply with at the local level. Um, before we get into Article 1, Section 1, Article 1 in the Pennsylvania Constitution is our Declaration of Rights. It is the Pennsylvania equivalent of the Bill of Rights. These are serious rights. Article 1, Section 1, you can't get any earlier. This is the first one. And essentially, putting some layman speak on this, Article 1, Section 1 stands for the proposition that in Pennsylvania, if you own land, you can do anything you want with your property. You cannot restrict people's use of the land. And we're going to go back to that. Article 1, Section 27 is the one either as an advocate that you advance regularly to your board, and as a board member, you hear regularly that people have a right to clean air and pure water. And these are rights that are very clear, and they say what they say, and we're going to have to delve into some case law and how the courts have interpreted this so you know, as elected officials or as citizens, how best to look at these rights that are um, inherent. Now, in the Constitution, what these rights mean under Article 1, Section 1, is these are rights that citizens have. And as a government, you can pass no law that would violate or injure those rights. Easiest to see would be take us to the Bill of Rights. If you say, we're going to have meetings and no one's allowed to speak ever at our meetings. That's our law. Well, that violates the citizens' rights that retained by them under, article, under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. You, in our municipality, you're not allowed to ever have a gun anywhere in the municipality. That would violate the Second Amendment. These are rights retained by the people. When you look at those rights in these lights, Article 1, Section 1, and Section 27 have the same effect. Next page. Now, this one may be new to some of you, and this one was utilized later in Robinson, and we'll get into this more from a municipal standpoint, but be mindful of Article 3, Section 32, because this is a very big one that's been largely ignored by the courts and by challengers and by local governments. And I suspect mostly because they aren't aware that it's, it's there. It's not used that often. I am in the middle of a challenge of a local ordinance and this 
is at the forefront of the challenge because basically Article 3, Section 32 of the Pennsylvania Constitution is our Equal Rights Amendment. And it is our, you can't create special laws. What does that mean? Well, the law should apply equally to everybody across the board. This constitutional amendment was enacted when the railroads came to town and local governments and the state government, everybody was making laws that basically exempted railroads. That everybody else has to stay away from homes, but not the railroad. Everybody else needs to stay out of this area except the railroads. Well, recognizing that you were catering to the favored son at the time, they passed this constitutional amendment and said no more. The laws will be evenly applied to everybody. And now as we move forward, start thinking about the idea of, okay, the initial thing I said was that you created or you inherited zoning districts, residential, commercial, industrial. Within those districts, you have housed residential, commercial, and industrial land uses. And even though that makes up good planning under your comprehensive plan, and it's a good idea, when we go back to this area, it's more than a good idea. It is necessary for it to be constitutional from a zoning standpoint. And we're gonna flip the page and we'll come back to Article 3, Section 32 later. Now this should actually read under, I caught this typo earlier. The first quote is under article one, grants broad flexible powers, police powers expressly limited, limitation on states power to act contrary to the rights. Now we talked a little bit about these. These are just the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania announcing these provisions. Now, as I said, under article one, section one, you have the right under Pennsylvania constitution to do whatever you want with your land. You know, you wanna be a McDonald's, you wanna be a steel mill, have at it. Well, how in the world can zoning be constitutional if that's true? Because zoning limits what you can do. You look at your residential districts and all of you have, these are the uses you're allowed to place in, these dist in this district. Commercial, same thing. These are the types of uses. These are permitted, these are conditional, these are special exception. Every one of them would run afoul of Article 1, Section 1 of the right to do whatever you want with your land, except for the police power. The courts have recognized that you do not violate the constitution if you use the police power, the power to protect people, to enact laws to protect people from public health, safety, morals. So we hear this all the time and, um, you know, this law violates my rights. This, this law violates my rights to do this or that. But the government has the power to do that if it's to protect. So every law, almost every time we're going to look and see whether something passes constitutional muster. And the easy one for everyone to understand is um, maybe you know, the, tr the trademark, you can't yell hijack on a plane, right? Well, that would violate your article, the, your First Amendment right to free speech. But the police power of the government comes in and says, yeah, but we're protecting people from the chaos that would ensue if someone were to yell that on a plane. So zoning is a product of the police power. You can limit what people do in their districts um, and not violate the first article of the Pennsylvania Constitution, but understand only if that limitation protects people. And what we'll get to in these next slides, go ahead and change it, is the protection is premised upon compatibility. So here, there's some older cases, if you look here from 1922, these are, as I said, this webinar is as much about zoning and understanding where we come from. So as regulations grounded in the delegated police power, zoning must accomplish an average reciprocity of advantage. All property owners in designated area are placed under the same restrictions, not only for the benefit of the municipality as a whole, but for the common benefit of one another. You look down at these other cases from the Supreme Court, Legislative division of a community into areas in each of which only certain designated uses of the land are permitted, so the community may develop in an orderly manner. The, the next one, the United States Supreme Court held in 1995, proper zoning is completed by the creation of districts in which only compatible uses are allowed and incompatible uses are excluded. Go ahead and turn the page. We look at the Pennsylvania courts have held the same thing. So what does this mean? We, for oil and gas purposes, we have to look at 
compatibility. Once you create a residential zoning district, you are creating a district which only like uses and compatible land uses are there. So if you look out your door right now, I bet you most of you will see a neighboring home to your left, to your right, across the street, you're in a neighborhood. One of your neighbors can't decide to rip their home down and build a McDonald's because there's a lot of children in the neighborhood and boy, they would benefit financially. And what they don't do is come in and, and scream and yell and say, this is a taking, you're not letting me use my property. They recognize this reciprocity of advantage. They're limited on what they can do to their property because you have the same limitations of what you can do on your property. You both can live in a residential area. You both can be residential land uses. That compatibility of land uses is the hallmark of zoning. So when we look at oil and gas as we get to, even here in the, in the Robinson Commonwealth Court case, and these, the Commonwealth Court Robinson case is still good law, where the court recognized zoning ordinances segregate industrial districts from residential district. There's a segregation of noises, odors necessarily incident to the operation of industry where homes are located. You typically categorize these uses. So you start to think, okay, well, I see where Mr. Smith might be going here because this is the background from which we now look and why the Commonwealth Court struck down Act 13 because they mandated industrial land uses in residential areas. And the court didn't say, boy, that's crazy. Local governments, you can do whatever you want. State, you can't tell them what to do. No, they were implementing a Article One, Section 1, what's called substantive due process analysis to say, is this a compatible land use? And they said, no, it's not. And because it is not, it is unconstitutional. If it doesn't, if Article 1, Section 1 says do whatever you want with your land, zoning says we're going to limit you, and zoning will be constitutional if we do this in a compatible land use way under the police powers. Placing oil and gas activities in residential in this vein under Act 13 in this court, the court said it's unconstitutional and it's struck down. Next slide. Now here, there's some cases in here um, that I, again, looking at 3304, that was declared unconstitutional, that be amended to violate basic precept that the land use restrictions designate districts in which only compatible uses are allowed and incompatible uses are excluded. They do not serve the police power purpose of the local zoning ordinance relating to consistent compatible land uses in enumerated districts of a comprehensive zoning plan. They are not in furtherance of the zoning police power. And again, when we get to these later cases, you will see the court at times straying from these, um, the basis of this decision in order to reach a different result. Because this is good law, this law is on the book. So when you go to your municipalities and they say, why can't we place these in a residential area? You say, well, the state tried to make local governments do that and the court struck it down as saying it was in violation of the constitution because it didn't protect people because it was not compatible with people who were living in those districts and living in residential homes. Compatibility being key. Next page. Now there are other, um, and again, I, I gave you a laundry list of different citations from which to draw upon later, but we're getting to the same area here. The, the test is whether the health, safety, moral, general welfare of the inhabitants of the part of the community effect will be promoted by the application of the ordinances, um, provide uniform uses in respect to zoning districts. So you see section 605, in fact, all of the um, MPC section 600s, for the most part, try to mimic constitutional obligations. They don't say so, but when you read them in line with these cases, that's what they're doing. And we have section 605 of the MPC saying, you provide uniform use in respect to zoning districts. So again, we look at these in the case law that speak to compatible uses, not just uniform. Next, please. This is uh, when I lay, or started my oral argument before the Supreme Court in Robinson, I cited this case of the court. This for you um, legal historians, Village of Euclid is really the birth of zoning and here they, they basically had a residential district that excluded all these businesses. And the, the US Supreme Court found that that was proper because you want to exclude residential areas from the confusion and danger of fire, contagion and disorder 
which in greater or less degree attach to the location of stores, shops, and factories. So here the Supreme Court again, finding that segregating uses is a proper use of zoning. Next, please. Now, this is an important quote and whether in context or not, but again, when you see these later cases where the Commonwealth Court seems to go off the rail and away from what I just did, they argue that the Robinson case was about giving the power to enact ordinances back to local government. Basically, it was about preemption. It was not. This is a quote from the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Uh, we were referred to as the citizens. According to the citizens, this dispute is not about municipal power, statutory or otherwise, to develop local policy, but it is instead about compliance with the constitutional duties. Unless the declaration of rights is to have no meaning, the citizens are correct. And what the court said was, again, this is not about what the now the courts are saying, trying to revise history and saying what this case was about was local governments giving you the right to do whatever you want. And the question for elected leaders is, once you understand is before we leave Article 1, Section 1, you have handcuffs on you. You cannot do whatever you want. You just This is not about um, developing local policy. Do we want um, cement factories in our residential area? Well, we don't think that's a good idea. It's not about delving into whether it's a good idea or not. It's whether it's constitutional or not, whether it keeps with the stated goals of your district. And I would encourage anybody on this webinar to go back and look at your purposes of your zoning districts for where oil and gas drilling may be looked at. When you look at the purpose of any residential district, and they all vary a little bit, but primarily it's for quiet seclusion. It's for you know having these neighborhoods. It has nothing to do with industrial activity. And as I often tell municipalities, I didn't decide how big your industrial zoning districts are. You have them on the books. All we're trying to do is to comply with the law that somebody has decided this is where our industrial land uses go and this is where this one should go. And what this backdrop, these building blocks we're talking about is, as you can see, is how is it that municipalities are, if compatibility is key, if the court held these issues are what they are, how is it that we're allowing oil and gas industries to walk outside of industrial zoning districts into areas where they're not compatible? Next slide. Now, the reason I put this up from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and, and there aren't a lot of slides on this, but I, there are a number of other cases um, where the court has called and including the Robinson case, has referred to drilling as an industrial use. So fracking operations and exploitation, Marcellus Shale at issue here, provision compels exposure of otherwise protected areas to environmental and habitability costs associated with this particular industrial use. So the argument that you will see, um, sometimes from solicitors, always from the oil and gas industry, and often from the Commonwealth Court, is this is not an industrial land use. And because it's not an industrial land use, we're not stuck in the industrial category or in the industrial cage of your industrial district. And my counter has always been, number one, the courts have already found this to be industrial. And there's multiple other cases after this that the court refers to it as industrial. But okay, then what is it? It's not commercial. It's not residential it retains its industrial use. So you can talk away or try to speak away from the idea that it's an industrial land use. And you also have, and we'll get to later, the idea that, well, we have shallow wells and you know they were allowed in these areas and they're fine. And there are different levels of industrial use. And everybody understands, as I indicated, that you know the industry won't even look typically to drill on land under a DEP permit that is at least 20 acres, and I've seen them as big as 50 acres. So the idea that a, a conventional well uh, that will take you know 10 square feet is the same is not very likely. And also, conventional wells may serve a function to provide free gas to homes, and you know be more akin to a water well on the property. And and so they're not the the same uses. And you keep that in mind when you hear the argument or make the argument that we have conventional wells. You're talking about apples and oranges. 
And the only and the best way to do that is to look at the industry either has already done it or has pushed hard to separate conventional drilling from the application of Act 13, what's left of it, because they argue they are different and those rules should not apply to shallow drillers. Next slide. Article 1, Section 27. Probably more of the darling of the arguments that are received and made because everybody can relate. It is very simple. It means what it says that citizens have retained the right to clean air and pure water. And if you want a, um, a nice read, then you go back and read the Robinson decision or the PEDF decision um, that talked about the environmental rights that people have. And the provision establishes you know, several rights, but the right to clean air and pure water, the courts have recognized is that there's an obligation. Um, this is where I think it's important because we don't have to go into great detail of what that means because that's probably another whole seminar but there's always the argument that the DEP deals with this, the state deals with this, local governments, we don't deal with your right to clean air and pure water. When you look back, when the court struck down section 3303, as we talked about earlier in Act 13, that was a preemption of local government's rights to enact any environmental laws at the local level to deal with oil and gas. When the court struck that down, the court did so because it said not only is that unconstitutional and you can't do that to local governments, local governments have an obligation to protect the environmental rights of their citizens. They have an obligation to be consistent with the constitutional rights of their citizens. And as we get to the real fight is what they need to know in advance before they create any laws. Next one, please. We already talked about the Article 3, Section 32. Um, this site you're here. Um, let's keep going. We're going to get back into, I believe, Article 1, Section 27. Next slide. Now, here, I point this out because the oil and gas industry, the ones that typically come to the communities and tell you that they're going to be you know, the best citizens ever, they only want to have the best laws apply to them. Well, when they went to the state in 2012 and passed these laws, the following laws are just a portion of the act that the court declared unconstitutional. The court struck down, I believe, 12 or 15 provisions of this oil and gas act that was drafted by the oil and gas industry that strip local governments of every right, strip citizens of every right, and put all kinds of triggers in here. So I point this out so you know what you're dealing with, because this is big money and they're not playing around. If they can take these laws that they lost at the state and they were found unconstitutional and rearrange them, renumber them and represent them, they will be happy to have you enact similar laws at the local level that were declared unconstitutional already. Next slide. Now, I put this quote, these quotes in here um, because the big issue that you see, and it is not without argument, a big issue and a meaningful one, to prosper. You know, we want them to make money. We want them to have opportunities. We get this from uh, farmers. Um, and I'll digress quickly. I always bring up when I say farmers, I met with the Pennsylvania congressional delegation once, and they told me that anything I would do to stop farmers from getting money on their land for their use of their land, they would lay down in traffic and stop me. And I should never do that because farmers were the backbone. And I said, well, I have farmers whose water was contaminated from drilling who are leaseholders. And without taking a breath, they said to me, well, those farmers, their land was contaminated before the oil and gas industry got there. So the farmers, they were so mindful of and protective of, they threw under the bus within the next breath to say, well, let them deal with their contaminated water supplies. But stepping back, here, the argument is, well, we, the welfare of our citizens is the economic welfare. And that argument was advanced in Act 13. So let's not pretend that this has never been discussed. And what the court held was if economic and energy benefits were the only consideration at issue, the particular argument carry more weight. But the Constitution constrains this court not to be swayed by counter policy arguments where the constitutional command is clear. No principle of law permits us to suspend constitutional requirements 
for economic reasons, no matter how compelling those reasons may seem. So when you are weighing, should somebody make money? Should they not make money? It is an absolutely crucial thing. But understand, you can't give up people's constitutional rights because someone could make money. And it's much easier to see when the understanding is in your neighborhood, your neighbor wants to rip his home down and become a McDonald's because he can make more money. And that argument goes across the board. If you want to make it, it applies to everybody. So you don't, you say, well, you can't do that because compatibility is key. That's the key, not economic. And understand this too, from a practical standpoint, drilling has advanced where they can drill four miles away and pick up people and get the same amount of money, the same amount of royalties. I have um, municipalities, I represent Peters Township. We have zero wells in the township and many individuals are being paid royalties because other municipalities have the well sites and those well sites are coming under Peters Township. So it's also, note two things. One, that the four miles is a pretty good span from which you don't need to have that much of your municipality open and these farmers can get drilled. And secondly, that if you have a weak ordinance, be ready to have people set up shop on your border in your municipality to drill the other municipality that has more protections. So your citizens get all of the effects and none of the money. And there's nothing you can do about that. It happens everywhere. In fact, a lot of municipalities, including Monroeville, um, are looking at that. So they're like, why should we let them in Monroeville when they can reach us from outside? And if your municipality is the one outside that you're the launching pad, you may need to look long and hard at that. Next slide. Now spot zoning, and, and I'm gonna move uh, quickly through this. The spot zoning is what every municipal official seems to gravitate to and they get it. That if I say in a residential district, I wanna come in and have you rezone 50 acres and make it industrial right in the middle of town, you would say I can't do it. And why? The knee jerk reaction is that spot zoning. You can't single out an area um, as set forth here uh, from the surrounding land because that would be unconstitutional. So what that really means, and this, this was the genesis of why would Article, why would Act 13 be constitutional if you're forcing basically uses of drilling into residential areas that would be otherwise spot zoning? And the court found that it would be a spot use and the same thing, but a spot zoning, no one's ever gone off the term. It really means it violates what we've already talked about, Article 1, Section 1, because you have a zoning district that says compatible land uses, residential only. Municipality says, well, I know I just can't add this use, so I'll try to rezone this little island and the courts regularly strike it down as spot zoning. So if you don't rezone, but you let oil and gas go in there and do the same thing on that same 50 acres and drill, it is the same unconstitutional activity just by a different name. Next slide, please. Here, this is some of the Commonwealth Court um, decision that fit appropriately here for you to know because the citizens that typically come to complain about drilling, the, the remark is, well, you're just mad because you don't have money, you're not gonna make money. It's, no, what the court found is citizens have made investment decisions regarding businesses and homes on the assurance that you as elected officials would be develop the zoning district in accordance with your comprehensive plan and only allow compatible uses. This is an oil and gas case. This is a case where the court found, yeah, and putting in oil and gas activity in these areas violates people's expectations. You're there to protect them. They bought their home thinking they were buying in a residential district. They pulled your ordinance. They saw the purpose of your district. They looked at the comprehensive plan. They got it. This is for residential. And then you're bringing in an industrial land use. Next slide. These are additional provisions that were also struck down by the Supreme Court under Act 13. And these were only, I only put these in here to understand that people forget what else the industry added. They added these provisions that um, the PUC would review local ordinances, not the courts, that if the PUC found your ordinance to be in the Commonwealth Court on appeal, violative of the law of preemption, then you had to pay the oil and gas industry lawyers and you would also lose your impact fees. So they put every hammer over local governments that they could so that they could do whatever they want. Luckily, again, more provisions of the, um, 
uh, found unconstitutional by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court under an oil and gas provision that said drill as permitted in all districts. Next slide. Now, there have been other cases that, you, that speak about the in, Environmental Rights Amendment. And the most recent one, probably being the, the most significant, is the PEDF case. Because you also hear, after we won in Robinson, you heard the argument, well, that's just a plurality. In fact, I heard it from the chief judge of the Commonwealth Court tell me it's just a plurality. What that meant was only three of the six justices signed off on it. They didn't have a majority. A majority struck the law down, but one justice chose a different route to get there. And so the court said, we don't have to follow it. Well, in PEDF, the court adopted Robinson and made it a majority opinion. Basically, they reaffirmed and said Robinson is a majority opinion. And they also struck down this Payne versus Kassab balancing test, which is for another day from a legal standpoint. But you'll, you may see that bantered around and that case has been struck down. Next slide. This is a quote from that case. When we talked a little bit about Article 1, Section 27, interpreting it, each branch of government must consider in advance of proceeding the environmental effect on any proposed action. So what we're seeing at the local level is setbacks, ordinances that are created, saying not only are we putting this not in the industrial zone, and, and the municipalities I represent for the most part, that's where they house them to the extent they follow um, zoning or have districts. Um, but you also have to create laws and, and you can't be arbitrary, right? So when the court's looking at, if someone challenges your ordinance, they're looking, did they act arbitrary? Did they act with any basis? When you say, well, we want the setback to be 600 feet and we want um, these different provisions to be placed in there. And when someone presses you and says, well, what did you consider in terms of the environmental effect of any proposed action? So I have no idea. And the typical fallback is the DEP looks at this. It's a good time to remind everyone the DEP does not. The DEP is not a health-based organization where they're going to award a permit for drilling and look at what will happen to the surrounding landscape or citizens. They don't look at it at all. They don't have health officials there. That's not their job. If there is an air permit required for a compressor station, they are looking at whether or not that compressor station meets pollution guidelines. They're allowed to put off, let's say, 20 tons of volatile organic compounds from a site. Well, they're like, they show, they say, we're only putting off 20 tons of hazardous air pollutants on a yearly basis. DEP is not looking at, is not asking them to say, well, how far will they travel? What will be the effect of those hazardous air pollutions on the citizens in this district? They look at none of that. So once you get over the fallacy that the DEP, it's not that they're not doing it on purpose, they're not charged to do it. It is your obligation to do it and understand why and how people will be affected because you better know in advance, as this says, whether people will be harmed by your ordinance. Next slide. This is again, just uh, to re fall back on where the um, PEDF Supreme Court talks about declaring the right of citizens of clean air and pure water and preservation puts a limitation on the state's power to act contrary to this right. And again, the state in this vein it would also include local government that you can't act contrary to the right. So you also, the big thing for us is, so you better know what you're doing because if you just rely on everybody else, um, you don't know because your ordinance is presumed to be constitutional. If you put a setback in a 700 feet, it's presumed to be protective of public health. You better be able to say, why is that true? Uh, next slide. This here is again, just the um, Robinson decision being adopted as now majority position by the Supreme Court in terms of Article 1, Section 27. So if you hear it's not a majority, you have the slide, it, it has been adopted. Next slide. This Abbey case, I've argued and briefed in multiple cases before the Commonwealth Court. They have never, ever discussed it or addressed it. Because this is a little bit what I was talking about, where people believe, and this court, and the Commonwealth Court in 1989 said, just because you get a permit from the DEP did not relieve municipal tribunals reviewing land use applications of the obligation to consider the impact of these proposed facilities. So you cannot fall back on the state in this instance, that 
This case is out there. It is good law. And here, the um, going to the bottom, it says, because the Department of Environmental at the time, resources now protects will regulate facilities operations. A palace testament regarding health, safety, and welfare was itself unnecessary. That was the municipal position. Next slide. But they rejected that and said, We don't agree. It would be tantamount to eliminating citizen participation, citizen health, safety, and welfare, and that they could come forward with evidence regarding health, safety, and thus would emasculate the purpose of the zoning board to resolve these issues. So again, when you, this is all just ammunition or knowledge that the DEP is not doing your job. It is your obligation to do your job. Next slide. Now we look at some cases after Robinson that went back up in here. Um, it's, it's important to know the Gorseline case because Gorseline did not have an oil and gas ordinance. They had a, a savings clause, a catch-all provision. And it said, you know, if we don't have an ordinance regulating, you have to go in a district that you have a compatible land use. They went into a residential agricultural district. The board approved it. The trial court reversed, citing Robinson. The Commonwealth Court, which almost 100% has ruled in favor of the oil and gas industry post-Robinson, um, they reversed the trial court and left, the, left it stand that you could drill these wells in this residential agricultural area because it was um, compatible with other uses there. Uh, next slide. The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania reversed and they struck down allowing oil and gas activity in a residential agricultural area because it wasn't compatible. They did not, they purposely did not do a constitutional analysis. They looked at the purpose of the zoning district. There's a stated purpose in all of your districts, you can look. They looked at the purpose of the district and they said you weren't similar to anything. And in fact, a lot of times following a case that I lost in Cecil versus Mark West, where the compressor station argued we're compatible because you allow public service facilities, you allow you know, sewage station, pump stations, um, electric grids, you allow all these things and we look like that. And the Commonwealth Court said, we agree. And they didn't take that up on appeal to the Supreme Court, but now the court went back up under similar. She said, you're not the same as a public utility because here the public is not benefiting from you. The public doesn't get anything from you like um, our sewage treatment or our water plants or our electric grids. Those are necessary for people to live in those areas. You are not necessary for that. And the court struck it down. Although the court, the reason we still have these arguments is the court did not entertain a constitutional argument as to what happened since Robinson. They just kind of ignored that, but did strike it down and it's good to know. Next slide. This is the case you will get hit over the head with, um, Allegheny Township. So a couple things to know in advance. Allegheny Township ultimately ruled that the Allegheny Township oil and gas ordinance that allowed oil and gas activities in every area of the municipality did not violate the constitution. So there's no hiding this case, but this stands in contrast to the Robinson Commonwealth Court case, which is also en banc by all the judges. This stands in contrast to Gorse Line, which just struck one down in the same year in a residential area. This stands in contrast to PEDF in Article 1, Section 27, and in the Robinson Supreme Court case. So you'll see that is my opinion at the bottom here. And one of the reasons, and, and I um, put in here that this incorrect holding, but that I focused on earlier is that the court, when you read the case, the court said, well, Robinson, Article 1, Section 1, all that case was about was giving local governments the right to do it, basically whatever they wanted. And that was not what the case was about. But the court need to reframe that case in order to get over the compatibility arguments that we spent so much time on. And they reframed the case saying, this was about the state telling local governments what to do and the local governments won the right to do as they please, essentially. And that is completely false. That is not the legal proposition. As I put this slide up earlier, according to the citizens, this dispute is not about municipal power, statutory or otherwise, to develop local policy. It's about compliance with constitutional duties. So when you look at Allegheny Township, when your solicitor tells you about it, when the industry tells you about it, you look at it and say, well, wait a minute, they got it wrong. 
they stand in contrast. They are not the law of the land. The Supreme Court is not the Commonwealth Court. Next slide. Then you see the application of Allegheny Township striking down the Commonwealth Court now using this wrong decision to strike down Middlesex case, to strike down Protect PT versus Penn Township. There are so many errors in the Allegheny Township case, but you see when you get decisions like this, they don't, and what they didn't do is they didn't evaluate Article 1, Section 1 or Article 3, Section 32 claims because those weren't made in these cases. Well, Article 1 was, but they um, got rid of it. But on a historical note, the judges that, and when we won in Robinson in 2012, there were dissenters, Judge, Judge Rob, uh, Robson, Judge Levitt, Judge uh, Covey, Judge Simpson, they are now the majority on the court. The older judges had retired and moved on. So the, the dissenting judges in Robinson are now the majority of the Commonwealth Court, and they are peeling away Robinson as best they can. And there are dissenting opinions in the Allegheny Township case that basically speak to that, that the court is hell bent on undoing what they didn't like when they lost, when they were in the, in the minority. Now they're in the majority. So just be mindful of that. Next slide. Slice of life, just understand in 2019, the by unanimous decision, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court struck down Airbnbs in residential areas because they were <laughs> opposite of residential character. Police power is not confined to elimination of filth and stench. It's ample to lay out zones where family values, youth values and blessings of quiet seclusion and clear air make the area a sanctuary for people. The unanimous Supreme Court said Airbnbs don't fit in residential districts. Yet the arguments is still advanced that oil and gas activity does. Next slide. So why do we update these? We talked about these issues, to protect the health, safety, and welfare, to protect against challenges, which we'll get into during the question stage. Next slide. You're drafting new ordinances. You're looking at the MPC. You're looking at setbacks. You're looking at zoning districts, and you're looking at overlays, which I will touch on in the brief period we have left. These are the issues you're looking at. You're looking at what you can do, where you can do it. What you've just learned tonight is the body of law that's out there and why. And you're looking at what is compatible, what, do, what are the expectations of our citizens? And I asked this question at one seminar, it always struck a chord. If somebody in Texas owned all the gas under your municipality, would you have the same ordinance? And they all jump out of their seat, no way. Well, who owns the gas is irrelevant. You're complying with constitutional obligations and compatibility. That's what you should be looking at, not who owns the gas. Next slide. This is just section 604. We can skip on this because this is for your reference. If you're drafting ordinances, be mindful of. Next slide. 605, we talked about uniform use in respect to zoning districts. Um, you, we'll get to in the question and answer more into this. How is it that oil and gas activity and industrial land use is allowed outside of your industrial zone? Next slide. The policy goals of municipality, you'll see the community ob ob um, development objectives under 606, and you need to see if they're consistent with these um, in your com comprehensive plan and or ordinances. Next slide. Um, setback issues, I mean, you can look at a number of things. The report of the 43rd grand jury that just came out this year that basically took issue with the lack of enforcement by the DEP made a number of recommendations after a year and a half of listening. Next slide. Here, um, we have municipalities, and there are a lot of them that follow the law in terms of industrial uses. And all you have to say is what other industrial land use are we allowing outside of our industrial district and why? And here, you want protection, you, people get afraid of being sued. You say, we treated them the same. We did our constitutional duty. We looked at compatibility. We already had an industrial district where we told everyone the purpose of the district is for industrial activity. This is an industrial activity. This is where it goes. So, you know, Peters Township, I told you, is still being drilled from outside and we do have industrial district where drilling could take place. Next slide. 
Um, I know I don't have a lot of time, but I do want to spend a few minutes because this question came up. Well, do you have to comply with the SAUDO? Because nobody does. I think the only ordinance that I've seen requires subdivision land development is Murraysville. But typically after an approval or conditional use, every other applicant, if somebody wants to build a shopping center, somebody wants to build anything other typically than a residential home will go through the subdivision land development, even subdivision may apply for residential and go back through planning and go back to your elected bodies. Here, for some reason, we've got caught up with once you get conditional use approval, you're done, you're out the door, go ahead and start drilling. So SAUDO does apply. We're gonna zip through these slides till I get to one I want to. We go to the next slide. We have about 10 minutes uh, left there, John, for this part of the presentation. Okay. So here, just here is a definition of land development for your uh, approval or review. Um, this is in the MPC and there's a subdivision of land. And, and the reason you look at this is typically a farmer might have, and I'm not picking on farmers, but they may have hundred acres and they're going to give up 30 acres for a drill site. If they were gonna give up 30 acres for any other activity that has boundaries in a defined area, they would 100% have to subdivide that property off and have the use comply with your SAUDO process. There is nothing in the law that says oil and gas doesn't, it's just, just they haven't. So next slide. Um, this is again, just for your reference, the MPC definition of subdivision. Next slide, please. Same thing with the development plan that here, um, that you have to have one with development um, development plan for the intensity and density of development, streets, ways, and parking facilities. Next slide. This is just a section of the MPC that I put for you for, for your, um, again, your reference. Next slide. There should be two pages of this. Yeah, and the next slide. Now, this is important because everybody has, or most municipalities have subdivision land development ordinances and you see them and you use them all the time when anyone's building anything and engineers come in and tell you how they're going to comply. Um, where you have, this is a quote, where a subdivision of land development ordinance has been enacted by a municipality under the authority of this article, no, look at the word no, no subdivision or land development of any lot, tract or parcel of land shall be made. It goes on open or dedicated except in accordance with the provision of such ordinance. So you can look long and hard, but if you have a SAUDO and this falls in the definition of land use or subdivision, and it's hard to imagine any other use pulling out 20 acres in the middle of otherwise land and not subdividing or getting a land development, um, the statute, Pennsylvania law says you must comply. Nobody does. And next slide. The problem with nobody does, at some point you could be sued. And when you're sued and said, you never even reviewed the, went through the process, or I have, a, I have a client who is a cement factory and you try to make him go through the SAUDO process in the same district. He says, why do I have to go through it? And they don't. You now got an equal protection claim because you're starting to going back to our special law. You're treating one industry different. You're putting them in districts they shouldn't be and you're not making them comply with the law. Now, what's interesting is um, this is an opinion I put Judge Levin in here because she has ruled time and time again. She's the author of the Allegheny Township case. But here there was an argument that a lease that residents, the Crown Castle um, had tenants and they leased you know, for their um, towers and that a lease wasn't a subdivision. And the court says they're not arguing that. They're arguing that um, it wasn't the license, it was the lease. And the lease conveys the, conveys the use of a discrete parcel of land that creates a subdivision, they are correct. So we don't have an oil and gas case, but we have a case where we don't have ownership of land that's gonna be there forever. We have somebody coming in and saying, I've got a 20 year lease to put this tower up. And the court said that lease to use a distinct piece of land constitutes, creates a subdivision, you've gotta go through the process. Next slide. And like every other oil and gas activity, they are through leases similar to this. Here, um, this is just another case to be mindful of that the asphalt was going, plant was going to, um, they were going to expand, I believe. And the court found that because of that, 
this was subdivision land development, they were obligated to render a decision conforming the requirements of 508 of the MPC. Uh, next slide. Now this case here is a, a billboard case and the court by contrast, and this is interesting because I've, I've seen lawyers use this to argue why oil and gas um, shouldn't be subject to SAUDOs. And if you go down, it says the type of division or allocation of land contemplated by the MPC, example, housing development, condos, building groups, implicates many legitimate government concerns affecting the general public, such as sanitary sewer, water, storm water, parking areas, et cetera. The construction of a billboard simply does not give rise to any of those concerns. So stopping at that quote, you would say, well, that makes sense. It's a good argument for oil and gas not having to go through that because they don't fall into any of those concerns. And typically this is where the lawyers lead off, but there's more to it. Next slide. This is the same court and the same opinion. And the court says, but by contrast, the white and Lehigh asphalt both involved a greater, more extensive use of land. And they said the white applicant intended to construct a 350 foot tower in a public park with three equipment buildings, all surrounded by an eight foot fence topped with barbed wire. And it also planned to construct a 20 foot wide access road to the site of the tower. This was less than an acre, a 20 foot wide, 20 foot wide access road. And the court said they are substantial encroachments upon the land. They are land use, they are subdivision. When you look at sometimes I have drill sites that are over a mile along the road and again, 50 acres in size. So looking at the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in 2007, it's very likely that they will find that you've got to go through the subdivision land development process. And if you don't and somebody drills a well, what happens when they sue the municipality and you say, well, we didn't do our job. We didn't approve it. We didn't make them go through and comply with all the rules and regs like everybody else had to. Next slide. Now, the other issue that I wanted to touch upon, and I think this is towards the end here, is, is overlay. Some municipalities, and I've represented some early on that we did this, that we used overlays to say, well, why don't we just create these overlays, overlaying areas of the town where we want to allow drilling, and maybe they will overlay residential, and that's the way it was going to work. But understand, an overlay district can't supplement an existing district. So you can't basically say, I'm going to have a residential district underneath and put an industrial district on top. They need to work together. The best example of a proper overlay is a residential area where you overlay with a historic district, right? Because it becomes more restrictive. It doesn't be less restrictive because if you're going to use an overlay in that fashion, it's, it's used improperly. And if, so these are things that municipalities wrestle with and how they're going to enact ordinances. And this is an issue that I challenge with Murraysville who did use an overlay and it's up at the Commonwealth Court now because half of the municipality, and this is the testimony of Murraysville's um, manager, he agreed that people in the same zoning district, some have greater protections than others because some people have an overlay that allows drilling, some people fall outside of it that don't allow it. And now you're treating people in the same zoning district differently. Now we'll have to come back a year from now and see how the court ruled on this, but that issue has never been brought before the court before in the oil and gas context, and I've done that just recently. Next slide, and this may be it. Um, this is important too, because the other issue people bring up, and, and there's Justice Todd wrote an opinion last year, and I apologize, it's not in here, and she talks about the impact fees and how what impact fees are. Impact fees are for negative problems that you have. They're not, for those of you that don't have drilling in municipalities yet, these impact fees are not grants. They're not like, boy, we've got all this money coming in. They are there to fix the roads that have been broken, to you know, put infrastructure in place to protect yourself. They're rightly called impact fees. And I represent East Finley Township. I can't say for certain, but we have at least 30 or 40 Marcellus Wells in the township. In 2019, uh, they received $439,000 in impact fees. Peters Township, I also represent, we have no wells. Our impact fee in the same county was $518,000. So be mindful of how the impact fee works. It doesn't mean the more wells you get, the more money you get, as illustrated by this. Uh, next slide. 
Now, this goes back to something I alluded to, the grand jury report, which is a public record, that they wanted to expand no drill zones, increase setbacks. In fact, after hearing from the industry, uh, from the DEP, from citizens that live next to these sites, they said the setback should be 2,500 feet from homes. They said, stop the chemical cover-up, regulate the pipelines, add up the air pollution sources, transport toxic waste more safely, deliver a real public health response, and the revolving door, meaning DEP officials go to work for industries and use the criminal laws. Criminal laws meaning that the attorney general gets involved versus the DEP having them pay a fine. And these are you know, part of a long uh, process for the grand jury to hear. And these were their recommendations that local governments they're speaking to should implement um, or at least should review when you're looking at your oil and gas ordinances. Because you have the advantage if you don't have an oil and gas ordinance yet to look back what other people have done successfully and what other municipalities have failed at. And lastly, I'll leave you with is the argument, well, if we have a 2,500 foot setback, there will be no drilling and that's exclusionary. Well, your, your job is to create ordinances that protect the public health, safety, and welfare. If you believe and your hearings define that at a thousand foot, it is not protective of public health and you make a setback at 700 feet, then you have a problem because you're doing it to facilitate drilling. You're catering to one industry and you're not following the police power to protect people. You're doing it to maximize returns and ignoring health concerns. Next slide. Okay, we finally done hear me chatter on. So if, if we're timely, I guess we can start any questions if we have them. Absolutely, thank you so much, uh, John, for that really great presentation. And we will um, all start our videos and get to a place where we can start answering questions. Okay, I came up for air, so I, I ran as fast <laughs> as I could. All right. That was a lot to sink in as Vanessa told you, but again, I, let's see if we can get to some specific questions and tailor this a little bit. So in the communities you represent, what recommendation do you make with regard to what zones are appropriate for oil and gas development? If my municipalities have zoning, traditional zoning districts, and I have some rural ones that don't, you know, they really don't rely on zoning districts. They don't have even zoning ordinances. But like Peters Township um, is in one of my municipalities, South Fayette, I do some work for. Both of those um, are right in the heart of the drilling areas and they allow drilling in their industrial zoning district. And the reason is, is they believe, they categorized this, they took evidence as an industrial land use. They looked at their comprehensive plan. They looked at their map. They looked at their ordinance. They looked at the purpose of the district. They looked at compatibility, that's where it went. And were their citizens upset? 100%. You know, they wanted drilling here, there, everywhere else. But again, and, and I was involved in the Jefferson Hills case, when somebody challenged Jefferson Hills ordinance, which the board found to be um, compliant, they had no idea that the industry could drill from outside of the municipality or from other areas. So here, to me, the safest route is to treat them like you would every other industrial use change oil and gas and call it a cement factory and say, where are you going to put it and why? It's a very easy evaluation at that point. How many zoning districts does a municipality need to make available for oil and gas development in their community? Well, here's the thing. The question that I've always had is municipalities, as I previewed in, in, the, in their discussion, They've created their district already. They sat down through their comprehensive planning process and said, this is how much industrial use we want in our municipality. I've not made that decision for my um, municipalities. That was in place. So are there any other times where you're trying to create more districts for one use? Or are you just using what you have, following your comprehensive plan, treating it like every other industrial land use? If you want more industrial land use, you have the ability to amend your ordinance and add it. Um, most places don't, even the ones that want drilling, they don't wanna give up their status of residential. The farmers like the ability to develop their properties for residential. They don't want the industrial tag, but they wanna put their wells on it. So to me, 
we're always looking at this industry. And the reason we're having this webinar now and not 30 years ago, because no one's ever done this. Everybody has played by the game. Everybody has played by the rules of their municipalities. This is one we're trying to squeeze them in and out of areas they shouldn't be. So some communities have already allowed some oil and gas operations like well pads. Um, can oil and gas ordinances and zoning maps be amended to change where those operations take place in the future? And if so, how have you recommended your clients handle changes to existing ordinances? Well, I didn't bring up in the, in the Gorsaline case, but the Pennsylvania Supreme Court looked at an argument where, where they were drilling in the, they wanted to drill in the residential agricultural area. And the Commonwealth Court said, well, you already have Marcellus Wells there. And the court says, we're not going to look at that. We're looking at this on a case by case basis. What is the law at the time? And if we were going to look at, you already let them in this district, then it basically allowing them in would have, would have been a de facto amending of your zoning ordinance already. And that's not the case. That's not the process. So if you have just allowed it in the absence of oil and gas activities, Gorsaline provides you shelter that says that we're not going to look at a past practice to say that you have to now let them in everywhere. Now, if you have an oil and gas ordinance that you want to amend and say, okay, we've had our share of residential drilling or areas outside of industrial and we want to amend, well, those sites are going to remain pre-existing non-conforming, right? There's nothing we can do to undrill those wells. They will keep that status. And most likely they've already built in their ability to expand that and they have natural expansion rights in your ordinances typically to allow for more wells in that location. Okay, can you give us an example of how or where environmental harms have occurred? And were there protections um, local governments could have put into place to prevent that damage from occurring? I mean, I, I'm aware of so many environmental issues and harms. I mean, in all honesty, I, I've been before the grand jury with multiple clients who were brought there to speak of of environmental harms. Um, typically, you know, spills on properties, uh, well blowouts, some are public, some are not. Um, you know, I have a client that I will tell you that his cows died and the company was paying him for the cows dying. And after a while they quit paying him. So my client had this great idea to take his backhoe farmer and he made a cow pyramid and blocked their access road. So he was arrested and um, they had to drop the charges because nobody would remove those dead cows but him. Um, so there are good and bad sites. Um, one thing in East Findlay, what we've done is we've made them because there's no requirement to report to local governments of any spills. No requirement, quite honestly, to report to any neighbors that they've had a spill. And we challenged that with the DEP and one of the Act 13 arguments. And we did have um, one of the drillers in East Findlay come forward and tell us, hey, we just want to let you know we've had a release. We think it's, you know, five or 10 gallons. I think by the time we were done, it was six or 700 barrels of what was actually released because they didn't know and it was underground and the DEP fined them and, and pretty significantly. But for us, we were concerned about, we don't have private water out or it's all no public water. So we wanna be able to react and at least inform our residents of what's going on. Um, can you please explain what the pending ordinance doctrine is and how it's used during the process of adopting new or amending existing ordinances? Sure, that, that's a little nuance under Pennsylvania law, but basically it, it tries to defeat a race. So regardless of oil and gas, any applicant thinks you're going to create a law that's going to take away or tighten up a certain use in a certain area, they run in and hurry up and file a permit to get in under the current law. Well, the pending ordinance, while it's through discussion and people on this panel know that can go on for a year, sometimes these ordinance um, hearings, while you're in the hearing process and while it's advertised, you can take shelter. There's a, there's a procedure to do it. You, in fact, the board normally will recognize or assert that they're asserting pending status. So if somebody comes in in the interim before the ordinance is adopted, the pending ordinance would be the one that's in place. And that's the one, even though it's not the law that's been adopted, you're not going to keep shelter under the old law. The pending ordinance will protect that the government from somebody trying to beat you in, until it gets passed.
What would you say to citizens or officials who claim that oil and gas development and operations must be allowed due to the fact that leases have already been signed? Or in other words, are signed leases the deciding factor in where a community should allow oil and gas development? No, I mean, but I, I get that. I mean, I've heard that a lot that, and that this goes back to the idea that laterals can go four miles. So that's hardly there's a place that can't be reached from that activity. And, you know, technology needs to adapt to the legal landscape. I think what we're doing now is the, a lot of municipalities are trying to adapt the other way around to, you know, cater to the industry. But these oil and gas people, like all of us, if I buy a piece of property tomorrow and it's industrial, and by the time I get off my butt to build my industrial complex, the municipality has rezoned it residential. I mean, I can go to the hearings, but I'm at the mercy of rezoning. We're at the mercy of changing laws all the time. And that's just the way it is. There's no taking or reliance upon that. It's, it's like every other use. In the introduction, it was mentioned you have worked as a special counsel on oil and gas issues in some communities. Can you explain the role of a special counsel or and um, how a special counsel might assist in preparing new or updated oil and gas ordinances? To the, to the last part of your question, some people will ask us to either review what they've already drafted help them from the beginning, help them run their hearings, um, what evidence to look at. Uh, one of the issues that municipal officials um, should know, and this is another issue that I have on appeal to the Commonwealth Court, and I have questioned, um, and the industry has stopped me from doing it, I have put the elected officials on the stand when their ordinance is at issue and asked them every question I would ask them about people being, you know, how far does the emissions travel? What do you know about this? What do you know about that? And they stare blindly, they have no idea. And the issue before the court as a trustee under Article 1, Section 27, you are a government trustee. Typically, legislative officials don't have to testify about why they created the law or passed the law. What I'm asking the court to look at is whether a trustee, as we are the citizen beneficiaries under trust law, have to testify about what they did in terms of passing a law in terms of right to clean air and pure water. So I know a little bit uh, stray there in terms of what um, special counsel do, but so I we do as little or as much as people want. Sometimes I go to hearings, sometimes I don't, sometimes I just review ordinances. Um, the problem is, as you see in the cases we talked about, I believe there's a bright line law with everything else. The courts have muddied this up and the industry has done a nice job of muddying this up. So people are torn as to what to do and you know there's big money against you, there's big money on the other side. Um, you know, and, and you fall back to the basic building blocks of, I just want to treat you like every other industrial use. If a cement factory came in, would we rezone our town to let them everywhere they want because we can make so much money, you know, with more cement trucks? It wouldn't even cross anybody's mind. If or when a community is considering new or updated oil and gas ordinance, ordinances, what are the most important pieces of advice that you would provide to them to include in that? Well, in the hearing itself, my advice is you, you better bring somebody in. There are people out there that will testify that have some knowledge about some of the issues you're concerned about. Um, I think the other thing that is being skipped um, is having discussions about compatible land uses. Is, is, what is this compatible with? You know, will this fit from a, from a zoning standpoint? Um, because again, the people that are coming in aren't complaining. They, they try to recharacterize their complaints as you're just mad because you're not making money. And they're not, they're mad because they bought their home, which is typically the biggest investment all of us make. And they're trying to just keep their homes and their kids safe from noise and intrusion. And that was the benefit of their bargain. They, they bought in your zoning district that you told them was residential. And now across the street, it's no longer the way. So I think you need to take the testimony of you know, people that know, and you know, they seem to dismiss the average citizen that comes in and just complains, it's gonna be loud, it's gonna be this. And they're like, well, once we're done drilling, it's done and it's fine. And you know, it's the same argument, this, this carnival moves from town to town. And you hear the same people make the same arguments and to sometimes this, it has the same effect. But that's where I would start. You have plenty of forms out there to draw upon in terms of lighting and road traffic. And um, we just had one, where you know, we do have, we early on we created the, you know, keep your big trucks off the road. 
while the kids are standing out for buses. A lot of these rural areas, their kids are standing out on these highways. And for the most part, that was, they were very receptive, but we do have issues. And we had issues two weeks ago and the, the parents were video and the trucks flying by the kids and the industry stepped up and we called them and it was in our conditional use. It was in our, um, one of our conditions and we told them we would shut them down um, if they didn't stop and they immediately stopped. So you better have some teeth um, in these ordinances. And again, you know, it, this is not any, it's not easy. If it was easy, we wouldn't be talking about it, you know, 10 years after Robinson, it, it's not easy. And you want your, your citizens to benefit, but I mean, bring somebody in about laterals where they can reach from. And I've always asked the industry, if you would just tell us where you want to go, maybe we could, you know, rezone this and make this the place. But they know as soon as they tell you the price of poker goes up because those people sitting in that area are going to want a lot more money if that's the only game in town. But even the cross drilling through municipalities, um, that's very helpful. And the longer they go, the better for everybody, you know, the less footprints. If a municipality realizes after receiving an application, their ordinance isn't protective enough, can they deny the application citing incompatible uses and then subsequently update their ordinances afterward? That's a tough one because I believe that they can, but I don't think the court's going to do it because the court's going to start with the premise that your ordinance is presumed constitutional. It'd be hard for you to argue against your own ordinance at the time, but to me, the constitutional rights never leave. So every act, if they vote to approve it, they would arguably violate Article One, Section One because it's not compatible. So there, I believe the window is still open because every time they act, they have to act consistent with the constitution. So that particular vote, if they find out, boy, this, we learned from this hearing that it's not compatible, we didn't know. Now, hopefully the fact that you're having a hearing, it's a conditional use. So within the conditional use, um, you can, you know, approve, deny, or condition, approve with condition. So there are probably ways to do it, depending on how your ordinance reads already, if you wanted to deny a use. And I believe um, Lisa may know in Jefferson Hills, the one that we ended up taking up to the Supreme Court, but they denied an application for a drill site in Jefferson Hills Borough. And they believed that it, they didn't meet certain environmental um, standards or they couldn't prove. I can't remember why, Lisa. Mine was more of an evidentiary issue. Do you recall? Yeah, um, EQ, we, we brought in citizens from a neighboring community, um, Union Township, and we had them testify to their firsthand experience and how they were sickened by the Trax Farm drilling by EQT. Um, Jefferson Hills gave EQT a couple chances to combat or to, to counter those arguments, to supplement the record, and EQT said no. And so they were denied because they didn't feel as though it met the level of protecting public health, safety, and welfare. And, from, and, the from, this, and, and from there, so people know, so here's a municipality that denied a conditional use application in an area where their ordinance said, this is a place where you can go. And it went up to the Supreme Court and they found that the Supreme, the Supreme Court found that the municipality could rely on the evidence Lisa just talked about to introduce an evidence um, in order to deny that use. So there are, are times where, where uses are in fact denied. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and if I can add one of the questions, John, that I hear most often, and I think probably Robin and Vanessa do as well, um, is there a hard and fast rule that a municipality or a township has to guarantee that their industrial zone is a certain amount of acreage, or do they have to guarantee that that it's available for oil and gas? Like, what's the if the if the industrial zone is there, but it's already occupied or it has limited land use of open open land? Um, what what can a elected board do about that? Yeah, and I guess the answer is you know, treat them like everybody else. If I own, um, you know, supermarket and I want to come into your commercial district, I don't, I look at your district, it's full. I don't go to the board and complain and said, you don't, you don't have any room for me. Now there, there is a line that's crossed at some point from an exclusionary standpoint, but that, that is like, if you have a sizable industrial district that's just built up, you don't have to make space. That's up to the industry. They can buy like anybody else, I bought out that block and I'm going to move forward and build my own high rise 
uh, I'm going to move forward and build my own drill site. So that's the, the way you have to go, because otherwise, what are you supposed to do when you don't have the room? You can't cater and you can't create. All you're doing is saying, we have an industrial zone. If you can fit, fine. If you can't. And that's what goes back to the Allegheny Township case. The court said, well, in effect, they couldn't drill in much of Allegheny Township because all the setbacks from all the existing structures. The court didn't go to the next breath to say, but you know, they're making hundreds of millions of dollars. You don't think they could spend 60,000 to buy somebody's home and rip it down, eliminate that setback and create more space to drill in certain areas? Absolutely. And, and it will happen. Right. Okay. Well, I think that that is all the time that we have for tonight. I know um, we didn't get to some of the questions. We will definitely get back to you Thank you all for joining us this evening. A special thanks to attorney John Smith for joining us and providing us with uh, his vast depth of knowledge. Um, remember today's presentation will be available to view on our organization's Facebook pages and sent out to you. And please be sure to join us for the final part of our webinar series on October 29th at 7 p.m. We will feature citizen team members from three different communities where new or updated oil and gas ordinances have become more protective. So they'll be sharing important lessons learned on engaging the community and engaging with their elected officials. Um, we appreciate all of you taking your time to watch tonight, and we hope you've learned more about how to engage with government officials and how to advocate for oil and gas protections. And remember, you can always reach out to myself, Robin, or Lisa, and we are happy to help you learn more and understand more. Um, and have a wonderful night, everybody. Thanks, everybody.